started by identifying the problems or the drivers that would have pushed us into a less peaceful country. And we said one of them was political instability. We also found that there was a, a, a level of distrust in other citizens. There was also a level of disrespect for human rights. And there was also uh, a likelihood of violent demonstrations. And there was also a level of organized conflict. So we said, how can we solve all of these problems? And we said, when you're thinking about this, because we gave you free reign to have spend a billion dollars, uh, and you came up with wonderfully inventive ideas, but in the real world, there would be a whole range of bureaucracies in place that would be fighting for that money uh, and who would be placing great pressure on elected parliamentarians and others to ensure that their proportion of the cake um, was as high as to a tease. Um, because there is nothing more powerful than an individual or an NGO that knows how to unpick, unpack, and <coughs> criticize a budget. And it's also a way of demonstrating you where the money flows. And in terms of corruption, there's no way in which you're going to be able to understand where corrupt monies are flowing unless you can really unpack a budget, see the kinds of areas where there are kind of you know, gray areas, uh, where things are not very specific and so forth. Uh, and so that becomes, a, that I think is a very important challenge for those of you who are involved in advocacy. Um, and I, and I, I know from my own personal experience in a variety of different NGOs and others, that when somebody can take apart a defense budget line by line and say, why is that when why is that costing so much and where was it costed and so you know you know there you know there's fat in every budget and that fat uh, is available for being distributed in all sorts of different ways. The, set, the, the third point I want to make is that in terms of your budget, in terms of your budgets, as somebody's already pointed out, I mean you were highlighting the velvet glove that sort of in a sense creates um, the legitimacy for the, the legitimacy for politicians. Um, that when politicians are making the decisions, they know they can't spend on the police, the military, the court system, unless they are at the same time spending some things on infrastructure, education, health, and welfare. And so there is a kind of a, there's a sort of a, there's a balance here that, you are, that the politicians know that if they were simply wanting to spend on coercive capacity, the populations would eventually rebel and they'd be forced to be repressive, as is the case in Zimbabwe and in, in Burma right now. And so there is a sense in which there is a dynamic here that means they have to buy legitimacy by spending on these social welfare functions. Um, uh, now, th now if, they, if they spend money on social welfare functions, though, then what happens is that the agricultural sector, the industrial sector, and the commercial sectors uh, get very antsy because they say, uh, you ought to be creating the right macro environment, macroeconomic environment, in which we can um, do business and return profits. So the private sector, insofar as it exists, or the subsistence sectors or the agricultural sectors, become really crucial players in budgetary processes. Because each one of them wants the government to create the right macro conditions for their own profitability. And so in a country like the United States, for example, the most powerful companies and corporations which have budgets that are much larger than the budgets of about 140 other countries, incidentally, um, they're the ones that are really, really calling the shots. You know, it used to be that when General Motors um, uh, you know, sneezed, the world uh, caught cold. Um, I mean, uh, now it's more likely to be kind of the situations. Even people who are very, very poor are very reluctant to change. And sometimes they're more reluctant to change than people higher up on the uh, economic scale because they're very close to survival. And so the stakes are very high for them. And yet you'd think they'd be, because their situation is so dire that they would be more prone to change, but that's not always true. So but if you want to do communication, you've got to learn, um, you have to kind of look at, assume that there's <coughs> resistance, and then figure out where the, is that resistance coming from. And, um, So th this is what, what you get out of it, I and mean, this is the rewards of good communication, you promote wider uh, participation and um, accelerate the process. So th this is the, what I would call the basic process. Uh, you know, you've got 
got to identify your audience. You got to know who you're talking to. It's that's where you start, and um, you have to learn about their informational needs. What do they what What do they need to know to make the kinds of changes you're hoping that they will make or you're trying to promote? And then again, you got to look at the uh, obstacles and uh, what's stopping from making that change. And often it's fear. Uh, that's, that's a very, people are just naturally afraid of change. And um, so the next step is then once you, that's your <coughs> data collection in effect. You know, the first three uh, points up there is you'll, that's how you scan the situation, that's how you assess the situation. And then from that assessment, you develop a strategy. Then you look around and say, okay, what tools are available? What's my budget? What, uh, you know, th there's no point, if 4% of your country is reached by television and 80% of your country is reached by radio, guess which one is gonna be the better tool? You know, I mean, uh, so, uh, and then, you know, from all that, then you develop, uh, so knowing your audience, and this man happens to be a minister of justice in Malawi. Also critical. And I think uh, I think yeah, somebody you mentioned something about the the the, the medium you use, right? Television is expensive and all that. That is true. But we must also consider what message are we delivering? The message you're passing across and the target audience must determine the medium you use. Like Masha Makuga was talking about, medium is the message. So you cannot begin to communicate to a former or Maybe a couple of years who is uh, not in Nigeria, for example, in television. He's there just because he's already. So it depends on the message and who you are talking to. So it's very important to you want to make you put that into consideration. Thank you. Well, I would like to just open it up to you a little bit. Uh, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, just I would like to ask you though, and definitely get most the variety of the communication tools, mm -hmm. it's, it depends upon the capacity of the people. Yeah, the capacity of the people. But um, during the peace process, right. there is so many people who is uh, negative to us. Right. How could we, we develop a positive communication between <laughs> enemy and the other party? Right. What tools uh, is very effective? Right, okay. Yeah. All right, did, you, did everybody hear that question? So in, uh, my country, uh, in my country, um, most of the youths and the f females are spending their time in front of the TV. They are seeing the episode, the family episode. Mm -hmm. And uh, we are trying to it's put like some... Soap opera? Uh, yeah. When you say a family episode? Yeah, yeah. family episode. Soap opera. So in, in the meantime, we, we are trying to give some, uh, I mean, New ideas or new knowledge wise, uh, uh, I mean, things to them. But uh, we fail. What is your advice for this uh, in the situation? How can we? How can you improve it? Yeah. What, well, you know, not having seen it, can you give me a hint about why you think it failed? Mm -hmm. What do you think that they did something wrong, <laughs> or there wasn't enough of it, or why? What when you say it failed, what makes you say it failed? Yeah, it is a, they are from the morning to midnight, uh, there are several episodes there, the right. family episode. But right. I don't uh, say it's a wrong or right, but they're hanging on the TV or right. television. So, and uh, if you say, try to give some uh, different thing, uh, they have no time. So through the media, how we can uh, face this problem, how we can give different things for the people. Mm -hmm. Are you saying that they watch too much television? <laughs> 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 trying to exploit the time. When right. they ask my sister or wife, uh, yeah, I am angry, it is waiting. Then we wait for until this. <laughs> <laughs> that's a, that's a form of conflict suppression. <laughs> <laughs> TV is just kind of so this, through this, I try to understand. Do you have any way? Do you have any new ideas to give in the meantime to give the new knowledge for them? 
Well, I mean, the one thing is that to try and use those programs to promote more progressive ideas. In other words, um, you know, we were in, working in Nigeria to promote uh, privatization of some of the uh, uh, state-owned enterprises. And one of the big problems was all this, uh, you know, ethnic rivalry and, you know, we were trying to promote uh, soap operas, in effect, you know, these Nollywood movies that talked about corruption, they talked about uh, cross-cultural communication, uh, making it better for people to work together. I mean, you know, there are ways of getting progressive ideas into those things, and then it's, it's a terrific pipeline of you know, good ideas. Bring some commercials. Okay, we're going to stop. Thank you, Jamil. Thank you. 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 Thank you.